Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is Rob Bonner from the Victory of Light and the Promise Revealed UAT uh, website. And today I'm going to be introducing uh, a new gentleman um, to the public as far as a contactee. He's been having some amazing contacts in the future. Um, his name is David. Welcome, David. Thank you, Rob. It's such a pleasure to be here. All right, I'm going to uh, read his bio. He will be appearing at my conference in July uh, 7th through 10th in Mount Shasta, California. And um, uh, he's had quite a, uh, uh, I guess I would call it a, a eclectic career. Uh, he was, he was, uh, uh, he raised lions in the Shambhala Preserve with his mother um, and Tippi Hendren in Soledad Canyon. Uh, he worked in the Mendocino, uh, Mendocino County Sheriff's Department. Uh, he, he became got into culinary. He became a, a professional, a winemaker, uh, a brandy distiller in sales and food. And now he has a, a little uh, place in in uh, Venice. Um, uh, it's Hermo Hermosa, Hermosa Beach. Oh, Hermosa Beach. It's a farm right. to table bakery. Um, what's the name of it in case people are in town? Uh, it's uh, Hermosa Pie. There you go, Hermosa Pie. So um, his uh, experiences began when he was quite young. I'm going to let him go into that if he wants to. Uh, we're just kind of doing an introduction to his incredible uh, career here and uh, in the extraterrestrial field and uh, started when he was younger. And then it began again, I believe, um, in 2016. He had visual contact. And then uh, he had some personal physical contacts, which are quite elevated. Uh, beginning uh, January 7th, 2017. Um, he's uh, currently enrolled in a university where he's in his fourth year studying his master's of science in astrophysics. Right. And he's currently pursuing two scholarship programs. Um, and I'm not going to mention his uh, the uh, places at this point in time for him. But um, he's very... Uh, specialized in communication, telepathy, and understanding constructions and methods used by ETs uh, regarding the nature of his downloads and energy information that they release. Um, how the downloads are processed by the human mind and many other things. And um, he believes that light flashes carry millions and millions of pieces of information and that they both guide us and help us find inner peace, but more importantly, how these special light messages we see prepare us for both meeting the extraterrestrials in a calm and emotional balanced state to teach us all the new stewardship of ourselves. He's finally right. able to discuss with clarity a new message of hope and reassurance for the community. His mantra is thoughts are things. Uh, so let's talk to David about he develops the spiritual tributes to convert the power of thought energy into manifestation of the environment. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to let you continue on with your introduction, and I'm going to preface this by giving a little of our history here. <clears throat> a friend of mine, uh, a good friend of mine, Nathan uh, Shakwa, um, who is... Uh, I, I, call, I call him Nathan Sciatica. But, uh, yeah, uh, my... Uh, Nathan Shakwa. My 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 my, my uh, telephone uh, pronounced it Squira, so <laughs> anyway anyway he is a, a construction worker and he met David and I guess they became friends and he's been telling me about David for some years and I said okay great I'd love to meet him and finally uh, we we uh, got together we talked on the phone a couple of times and uh, right. Nathan had me con uh, connect with him at his house uh, in the Pasadena area and. Um, since that time, uh, Davis followed some of my information, and I was actually doing a show before my conference with Vivian Chavez last year, and David noticed uh, I was visited. He'd been talking about his friends. He said they know of me and stuff like that. So while David's talking, I'm going to share some images, and then as they're going, David, you can, you can uh, maybe comment on them. I don't want to take away from your talk, but I'm going to show you a bunch of images. There's some little uh, they're not gray beings, although they're similar in appearance. They're smaller right. beings, and they're uh, they have blue skin. And right. the information that he shared with me, he's quite an artist, and he's working on technological information. And we'll get into that in the next part. And I have a couple of questions I, I am going to ask him that 
uh, he wants to share some information about. So why don't you go ahead and uh, if you want, you can talk about some stuff and uh, I'm gonna pull up the images now. Okay, uh, well, I, I thank you so much. What a, what a great introduction. There's life, life is uh, such a beautiful thing and, and it can be so very complex and sometimes overwhelming or if we just accept things on a daily basis, life can unfold into a beautiful, beautiful um, adventure. And when I got to know you, it was a uh, happenstance that some of the, the little fellows, the little beings, the light blue, light gray, blue skin uh, extraterrestrials that visit me in the bakery were peering through your window. There they are. There's one on the left. And then you see the little round one on the right. And they're looking through your window. Now, these two are a group of four that come to my house occasionally. And I just drew that little line on there to help you see them on the photo. They're very dear. They're very sweet. Um, they don't have an AI agenda. They're not part of a bigger, you know, uh, Kabbalistic plan. But I watched them uh, come up to your window while you were talking to Vivian and start peering in. And this is part of the magical, wonderful thing about being in psychic communication. When I started to have my physical experiences, right away I noticed that my brain was changing and that they were creating electrochemical avenues for immediate communication with them. But whenever I talk to somebody about them or I have an experience that has something to do with them, they start showing up. And of course I was talking to you or watching you and you're my friend now. And so they immediately popped up to outside your window because they can geolocate. Um, it's a, I don't know how they do it, but remember that they can travel very, very quickly. And it doesn't matter if there's, you know, visiting somebody in Greece and all of a sudden they could be in Los Angeles, California within seconds. That's how fast the ships are. And so they actually came down to visit you. And I received a download, uh, a psychic message from my friend, Kim Jim. And he said that they know you, Rob, and that they like what you do and that you're a very kind man. And this is interesting because I've looked at the body of your work and I've heard things about you. And, you know, I always like to draw my own conclusions. But when Kim Jim said that you were a very nice person, it really allowed me to say to myself, okay, go ahead and open up and, and, and tell Rob what happened and, and sort of bring him into your life. And so it's really been a, it's such a great pleasure to get to know you and, and become a new friend of yours because you're, you're such a great guy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I, and tell Kim Jim, thank you for uh, supporting me there. Uh, I'm going to go. He's, watching, he's hearing all of this right now, which is great. And it's a constant contact. And whenever we have dialogue or whenever our heart is swollen with love and we're talking about the wonderful things that are coming and the wonderful things that are happening, he shows up, he dials in and they're multidimensional and they don't have to uh, focus like we do. You know, it's not that 14% of the view when you're driving your car, they can focus on many hearts and souls. And so he can focus to probably 150 beings, 200 earth beings, and communicate a message of love. And so I'm part of that lucky family of contactee that have got to know Kim Jim. Well, and those, I'm little, those gonna... little guys who came to visit you are part of the four that came into my house that, oh, cool. that initially washed me down and put me in a smock and took me to see Kim Jim. So they're very sweet. Yeah, there's an interesting stuff. I'm going to go through some pictures. You can comment on them. And then, uh, I mean, folks, uh, we have a lot of... Uh, evidence photographically david has been able to take pictures on board the craft which we're going to share with you and uh primarily um he's got some technology i'm not gonna um i'm gonna let him reveal that because there's certain things that are sensitive that i'm not uh allowed to talk and i always want to honor every one uh, he gave me a big download uh i went saw for an hour and a half i couldn't remember the entire conversation but um so i'm going to share some of these pictures this is the this picture is the this this red light yeah that you're showing is um okay now this one's amazing i call this the life store and this isn't the first time it's shown up this is the third visit but this is as close as it's ever come we all know about the death star 
Well, I call this one the Life Star because it's about the same size as the Death Star. Now, this is very interesting. That branch that you see there next to it is a Chilean mesquite tree that has a canopy much like an acacia tree. It's 16 feet up in the air. And I'm pointing the camera, my cell phone camera up. And this showed up on one of the nights that I was talking to one of my dear, dear doctor friends at SpaceX about um, uh, deep uh, stellar cartography and uh, mapping deep space and then the, the difficulties of, of terrestrial physics that we can't really apply in, in deep stellar space. Towards the end of her conversation, it turns out that you know, I'm sort of converting some of the kids from SpaceX over to my side saying, look guys, they're real, they love us and they have a message for us. And so far I've got five or six really important doctors and physicists at SpaceX who are on board. And they're my private little sleeper agents to uh, throw in that little, that little wrench of doubt every time some empirical minded mainstream scientist stands up and says, there's no such thing as aliens. My, my friends now are starting to collect their own photographs. So the Life Star, fabulous. Uh, it's a big, big round ship. And the blow-ups, the close-ups I have of it, I don't know if I say, shows these amazing white rectangular platforms that come on all edges of this orb. It's a massive, massive ship. Well, after my friend and I were done talking about stellar cartography and uh, deep space physics, uh, that ship showed up over the garden as you know she got up to hug and i went look 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 and then we looked up now this is a this is a orbicular craft this is a, a this is a sort of a this one here is a, an hourglass craft and and it's fabulous and it, and this is the same craft and it's morphing and these are you know light manifestations there's a nice shot of the the that one out this is fabulous this came right across that one whoops can you go back one this one this one Oops. came right across it in temecula california i was staying down at south coast winery and um uh i was sitting out at 9 30 p.m and i'd had a long day and i i just reached out to the stars and i said will you please come and say hello to me i'm i'm lonely and so that craft came out and was just bright and so happy and just flew right above my balcony. Man, there's there's a secondary craft that is not coming in or out of it, but it's attached to it. And this is that little one just to the left of the big light is the second craft. I call those telomeres. And tell that's the big one with the with the white rectangles. Those are actually like platforms that stick out of this big sphere. And if you get a real good close up, and I'm going to get you some because a friend of mine at JPL is putting that through a photography filter to get more of the geometry of it. And it's a fascinating ship. But that round blue sphere is giant. It's super. Oh, that's Kim Jim ship. All right. Now that was taken by me on January 6th, 2017, at about 11.30 p.m. And that's the ship that came came right down from the top of the sky, blacked out the whole section of Hermosa Beach where I live. My dog, I have a Japanese Akita, she curled up and passed right out at my feet. And I looked up and there was this vast disc slowly rotating above me, but it was pointing down. So I'm looking up at the edge and I just was so, so overwhelmed. It's the size of about three aircraft carriers. And I thought to myself, and this is after some reaching out for psychic contact. This is between my initial visual contact in 2016 up to 2017. So a whole year later of reaching out to them psychically and sitting on my balcony and, and exchanging thoughts, this showed up. And I, I have about 20 photographs of it. And I asked it to rotate so I could see its propulsion system. And it did. I asked it with my mind if I could get my phone out and take some pictures. It's very important that you ask permission. This is really amazing. This is a giant, giant. Uh, you can see the round rectangular craft on the left. That half moon light that came out came directly out of it. And then I didn't notice until later that there's a little squiggly sort of half circle ship below as well. This is beautiful. This is over the Santa Monica Malibu Mountains. 
I took this about four or five months ago, about five months ago, and I videotaped it. And this is really a nice videotape. It's on my YouTube channel. And it's one of the few times where, you know, when you have the intuition to put down what you're doing and go outside and just look up at the sky because they communicate that. It's like, drop what you're doing, come on out. This was at like one in the morning and I was doing homework. And so I, I put my homework down, grabbed my phone, put on a jacket and went outside and I pointed my camera up. And as soon as I turned my video camera on, the ship showed up. So they told me where to point the camera, what direction, what apogee, what angle, and then the ship arrived. And this, the big gray line showed up first and then that big white ship came out of it. And later in the video, you see lots of little telomeres coming in and out of the craft. This big ship is what I call an arc or a collector ship. And what I've been seeing down in Southern California are these vast, vast rectangular ships that almost look like, like a pallet, a, like a wood pallet, but they're gray and they have two trapezoidal legs and they come down over the ocean and they harvest vast amounts of water. And what I think they're doing is taking, uh, taking fish and fresh water and cetacean and plankton they're, they're, they're collecting large, large amounts of, of ocean water with animals because they're transporting them to a holding planet where they can be protected. There's a lot of uh, environmental changes on the planet that I know that all of you know about. So I'm not gonna preach to the converted. They know about it too. The earth is a fabulous water planet and they're very concerned about it. So they've been removing species in these giant arc ships to protect them on terraformed planets. The planet that I eventually went to called Bro Kali is such a planet. It's a moon that was turned into a verdant, beautiful green and terracotta earth soil water world. And there's a lot of these little worlds that are dotted around um, the outside of the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud in systems like Kepler 90 and some of the other systems. Oh, this is great. This is one of our little friends who came to visit you. This is in my bakery. And if you want to zoom back just a little bit, yeah, I'm sorry about the angle, but what, you can what, see where it. I, is this like, where's the head? I, I can see this is the head and he's kind of a body here. Okay, those two dark spots next to each other, those are his eyes. And you can see his eyebrow at the top middle of the screen there. Now go back out. There's another one of him. That's a little further away. That's the close up. That's his eye. You just had his, you had your arrow on. Yeah, it's it very kind of light, I'm sure. There, there it is. Now, this is right across my stainless steel bakery table, and he's playing peekaboo, and he's putting his head up from the side of the table, and I got my camera, and I took a picture. He's the same one that's outside your window when you were talking to Vivian Chauvet. They're really adorable. They're, they're totally, totally innocuous. They, they love us. They're little helpers, and there's nothing to be afraid of. So if they show up in your house or anything, just talk to them. They respond to baby talk. So I know that sounds silly, but they don't mind. And it's part of that heartstring harmonic. When you're talking to a baby or a cute little animal and you can't help but love them, they respond to that. So it's, it's a nice way to communicate. And some of them that have vestigial mouths uh, that are able to make some tonal quality, you can hear them and it kind of sounds like a squeaking little animal or a little baby. So they're adorable. Now this is inside the the craft that I was taken on right before I had breakfast with you at Nathan's house about a couple months ago, wasn't it? A month and a half ago. Right. Yeah. And so, so I'm going to, I want to give a little history here. So, so David has, uh, I mean, you could maybe go back to your contact, but this is a very um, um, interesting type of technology that they run the crafts on. These are right. giant crystals and you right. can see a whole bunch of them as we go through. They're set up like they're lamellar, and they're about 22 to 26 feet high, and they're about a foot to a two feet wide. And, and they're solid. About, <laughs> so each one weighs about how much? You said they're incredibly heavy, right? Probably 150 to 200 tons. Each, each one. Each panel. They're massive. But they resonate, and they convert 
vibrations and energy from the ship passing through space. And I know that all the physicists here on Terra are going to tell you that there's no friction in space, but there is. There's a type of friction. It's a harmonic frequency. And the ship uh, collects those frequencies. And if you've ever seen, there's lots of ships that operate on this principle. Some of the old photographs that kind of look like a saucer with a hat on it, and it has the three orbs on the bottom, the three black orbs. This was a spherical ship that had those same three orbs. Those orbs collect um, uh, stray voltage or in the form of stray frequency. They convert that frequency into a series of vibrations, which then is sent like a dipole loop to power the ship. So once the ship is turned on, it can't be turned off. And the this is the ships are the ones that are like that. They're actually uh, for inside the uh, Earth's atmosphere, generally speaking. They can shoot outside the mother ships or the cigar shaped ships of the Venusians are, are uh, different, but they, they describe their technology without giving it all away. They use a dielectric dirt, a dielectric between these balls and right. they charge the energy and they run on the Earth's magnetic pathway. So we've got some amazing pictures here uh, some of it has to do with what's called quantum chromodynamics, and it's it's quantum field theory stuff. I'm not going to bore you with it, but now this is a, a picture they allowed me to take in between the panels, and that just shows you the the sort of the depth and the width. And go ahead and, and put another one of the interior ship pictures on there. Now this blue orb on the right is actually a tunnel. Now, see how it goes down and down, down deep into it, and there's another ring, right? So that's a very long tunnel. This is called an ocular tunnel, and it's for changing your dimensional gateway. Now, go back to that previous photograph. Now, that's the ocular tunnel entrance. Uh, there's another one, but you see the crystal panels there. Now, once you go to the side of the oculus, there's no tunnel. So you can see these crystal plates stacked up. So when you're in front of it, there's an obvious long, long tunnel. But when you go to the side of it, there's no tunnel at all. There's just 60 of these super massive crystal plates. It's really fascinating technology. Now go to the other one, which is really fascinating. And it's this, the one that has the white, that's it. Now this is a, a frequential gateway. This ship is very interesting. The, have you ever heard of a Kerr mantid, a black mantid being? Um, I've heard of the mantis beings for sure. Well, when I got I onto this ship, it was as well. by this beautiful black tall mother and she had two or three offspring in her arm. She's very friendly and she welcomed me onto the ship and just sent me towards Kim Jim and just said, stand here, everything will be fine. This is the uh, the frequential gateway. Now this ship had both an ocular and a frequency gateway. It's is a can I ask you a question real quick because Raymond says that the mantis beings can actually open portals and stuff. Is that why you're connecting this with? I, you know, and this is really interesting because I'm really only concerning myself with Kim Jim species. And on my initial trip, there was a sort of a Sophia figure this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, little little gal that had long black silky hair and she had uh, freckles like ostrich mark, uh, not ostrich, but giraffe marks all over her skin. And when she was taking me across the midship's deck to my chair for my trip to Broccoli, she said, like, because the controllers in the middle of the ship, she said, only gaze upon their greatness with peripheral vision they don't really like your species. And so, you know, I could understand why. I mean, humans smell funny. And these are very elegant, tall, articulated beings that have beautiful clothing and stuff. So the ship may have been of mantid design, but what it does is it carries two separate portholes within it. So, you know, like the TARDIS and Doctor Who, so it's this phone box and it looks tiny on the outside, but when you get in, it's this giant, you know, space. Yeah. Well, this sphere was very similar to that, except the phenomenal thing was these two gateways. So within the ship, while you're traveling, 
you could walk into either one of those portholes and end up in a different place. So it's just fascinating. Not time travel, but differential, uh, differential space movement into a new area. One of them is activated by sound. The other is activated by light. And it depends on that type of area that you're going to go to to use one or the other porthole. It's fabulous. It's a ship that flies around with two gateways inside of it. That's it. Now that black ball okay. on the bottom. Hold, okay, hold on a second. I want. I think before before we get to that and go into what you're doing and all that stuff, why don't you take us back through uh, the description of uh, I I forget which one came first, but um, you had a meeting late at night and they took you to a beach and there was a tent and it also was much bigger than right. it appeared, but. Um, uh, actually, let, let's share a little bit about your your uh, contact when you were young, and okay. and you were at the the lighthouse back east. And then let's take them to your next contact. And uh, you can take your time with it. I mean, you can go uh, talk about uh, go as well. Uh, I, I don't I don't have a I don't have a lighthouse experience. So you may have. Got I, mean, I mean, weren't you like you, you woke up on the on the point? Yeah. Now, was that a lighthouse or it was just the end of a jetty, right? Yeah, it was just in the jetty. It's in, in the vicinity of, of Palos Verdes. And when I was very young, I used to sleepwalk. <laughs> and, um, you know, aside from doing what other children do, I used to disappear. And, and then I would come back. My mother uh, realized that I was bilocating and transporting. My mother was very, very, I'm, I'm sure she's passed away now. Her name was Penelope Bashan and she must have been a, a, a Lyran because she raised lions for 30 years and, and developed affection training for the actress Tippi Hedren. And Tippi and her were very, very close until towards the end they had a bit of a falling out, I think. And mom moved to New Mexico to move to Zuni Pueblo and live with native peoples. Um, but uh, she knew that I was bilocating and that they, I would go to bed and then I would disappear and she wouldn't worry. She would come back in and there I would be reappeared. This went on for a while until I was becoming more cogent. Dr. William Brakey at Johns Hopkins Memorial uh, Hospital in Baltimore, America, uh, Maryland was, was contacted by her. And uh, he said that, that very unusual things happen to children before the age of eight. He said, right at the age of eight, all children have a genetic trigger which causes them to develop and open up their logic and reasoning center. And he did a study with many, 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 many hundreds of children where he took an equal amount of clay, each a pound in weight. One he rolled out to a snake, the other he rolled into a ball, and he showed all the children that weren't eight years old yet and said, which one's bigger? And all the children pointed towards the snake because visually it was bigger. But as soon as those children turn eight by their birth, birth date, right on the day of their birthday, right at the hour that they were born, there's an electrochemical genetic trigger in our minds. Every one of those children went, uh, they're the same size. And it's after that point where sort of that womb connection magic starts to disappear because it's our inheritance into the modern world of man. So before the age of eight, I was coming and going. So when you had that first experience, did he come in and walk you down? I think you remember uh, he was holding your wrist or something and talk. You can talk a little about his physical characteristics. There was a lot of there was a lot of that, and you know, to be quite honest, I, I think that I think the pertinence is really in the relevance of what's what's what transpired after 2017. My my childhood memories are very vague, and um, but I do remember at one point when I was seven or eight years old, my mother and I were in the back garden in our beach house and we saw some lights in the stars. And remember Los Angeles back in the sixties and seventies didn't have the light pollution it has now. Yeah. And she says, you see those lights that are moving? Uh, she said, those are ships that were being visited from visitors from other planets. And I think that they know you. And so whenever, we, and I laughed, you know, cause I was just a kid and we, I went back in the backyard every night looking for them. And every time they'd fly around, I'd wave, sometimes <laughs> they'd stop. But as I got older 
and, and started, you know, putting those things aside and becoming a man, a young man and stuff like that, I, I sort of forgot about them. And I think that there was a reason for that. As it turned out, when I had my primary contact with Kim Jim and was allowed to remain awake, he described to me everything about my life, why I was born, and how many lives in the past that they had been working with me. And the reason I was allowed to remember my experience on this trip was because they were very concerned about me and my emotional health. They knew that I knew something was wrong. I was sort of at a breaking point where I wasn't going to have a nervous breakdown, but I honest to God, Rob, I felt like there was a whole other me, a whole other life that I wasn't allowed to connect to. Yeah, you had to. And I could, you know, and I could find it when I sleep. But when I woke up, I just had to be, you know, Mr. Normal, Honest John. But when I'm, when I'm asleep, uh, then I got to go away with my friends. And it's funny, too, because Mary Rodwell said, said something very interesting lately. It, it was that, you know, if, you're, if you just have a dream, a dream lasts anywhere between two seconds to 15 seconds, maybe 20 minutes at the most. And normally you forget them. But when you have a dream that lasts for five hours long and you remember every detail, snap, it's not a dream. <laughs> so yeah. I think she's absolutely correct. So um, so let's talk about, I, I found the visitation where uh, kind of like you had a valet, a team of valet to come and prepare totally. for that. And why don't you take us through that experience? I, I found it pretty interesting. Uh, they think it you was, think, and so they rubbed you down with seaweed. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, it was like, it stunk like seaweed. Um, on the evening of January 7th, 2017, um, I was watching uh, uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow with my then-time girlfriend and my son. And my son's, you know, in his, he's 20 years old. And uh, it's a fun movie and it was on late at night, but I was getting tired. And so I, I, I had done my thing on the balcony and closed the balcony door. And I turned to my girlfriend and I very specifically said, don't lock the glass sliding door tonight. It's, it's a hot night out. And then I looked at my son and I put my hand on the side of his face and touched the top of his head. And I said, sweetheart, if four little people come in the house tonight, don't be afraid. Okay. <laughs> Just out of the fucking blue. It was just bang, you know. Why the hell would I say something like that? And so that very night, that very night, they came into the bedroom and stood next to my bed. And the little blue one that came to see you, he's the tiny one on the right, not the taller one. The little one. And the little one on my bakery table, he touches his forehead to mine to wake me up and his skin is cool. And so when he woke me up, there was these two giant blue eyes right there. I thought it was like in an aquarium with a fish, you know, right on the other side of the glass and they blinked and I heard his thoughts. He said, David, head warm, feel nice. Yeah, don't be afraid. I think he should have maybe popped that in there too. No, he didn't need to, you know, they, they give off this beautiful, aura or this beautiful energy of calm and relaxing and they made me feel so good i just felt so good i felt so so cared for and i think that's what it is it's this really powerful emotion of care it's a benevolent care and they exude it in spades well they they i i sleep in the in the buff so they sat me up on the edge of the bed there was one taller one and was I called her. your girlfriend there. She was knocked out. She couldn't be woken up and I had no interest in waking her up. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. They, they do that. <clears throat> Normally like nor I have a Japanese Akita, right? She'll, she'll take your arm off if she doesn't like you. And, and she was knocked out. So they do something. They, they knock everybody out. I don't know what they do, yeah, but yeah. they woke me up and they sat me up on the edge of the bed. I wasn't afraid at all. You know, my son and I had spent a whole year sitting on our balcony developing tele uh, telekinetic and, and psychic communications with them because the ship started showing up and stopping in front of our house. And it was a different ship every night. And we'd go out between 8.30 and 9.30 every night and they'd come and we'd talk. And it's been a beautiful relationship. Well, 
they came in the house and they took me. They st stood me up on bed. And the little guy that touched his forehead to mine was telling, it was sort of admonishing number two and number three to be gentle with me. And, you know, you don't have to be too gentle with me. I weigh 240 pounds and I'm six foot four. I'm a big gorilla. But they scrubbed me down with this green cloth and it smelled like seaweed and broken seashells. I mean, just really sort of like crushed seaweed and, and crushed cockles. It just had that salty iodine smell. Brush me down with that, put me into this little white smock that just sort of came right just below my waistline. And then I don't remember how they got me out of the house. But the next thing I remember was I was, was standing above the sand, about six inches above this sort of the crenellated footprints in the cold night sand in Manhattan Beach. One of them had this hand and the other one had this hand and they were holding my hand, hardly touching, but they were supporting me. And there was a blue light at my feet and they were gliding me across the sand. And the two of them were looking up at me saying, special, special time for you, David. Keep your heart full of love, David. Everything will be fine. This is your special night, David. And it kept reassuring me. It was unbelievable. But then they started giving me protocol downloads, like don't show your teeth. Um, make sure that you remember that what you think they can see. All this stuff, trying to be helpful to meet Kim Jim. And Kim Jim was the is a great ambassador and i know that there's contacting on our planet that have met him before because he's told me that he has and they he loves us very much kim jim is not part of the watchers he's not part of the elders kim jim is an ambassador from the galactic council of scientists who regulates the distribution of information and creates a human net of love and he's setting us up for ambassadorial work when the big time comes, when they come to stop the bad guys and save the planet, and they help us do that by teaching us that the stewardship is to steward ourselves, that thoughts to things, so that when you think something, that you create that, you manifest that by the power of your mind. Kim Jim is an ambassador that wants to help us open the power of our mind the way we used to use it four, five, six, seven thousand, eight thousand years ago. And so I, I walked into this, up to this tent. Well, I didn't really walk. I was floating on this blue light. And the tent looked like one of those trapezoidal sort of 1920s bathing cart tents you'd see on a beach in 1920 that had the big striped canvas yeah. top. Yeah. Only it was this gossamer fabric. It looked like gelatine. And you couldn't see through it, but it was this gorgeous electric teal and electric blue color that just sort of glowed softly. All the lights around us, and I know we were down at about 26th or 28th Street, Manhattan Beach, because all the lights on the Strand and all the houses were out. And I got into this tent, I walked inside, and then I followed this pathway. My two little friends left me at the door. The door of this tent opened up like scissors. It was like a, a V shape, and it went like that. And when I passed through it, it closed again. And I went down a hallway and I saw one of the rooms was glowing sort of a white blue color. So you could and walk? So, what? At this point, you could walk on your own? Yeah. Yeah, I could walk. I could navigate. But I just remember, this was strange. Walking was strange. I felt like I was sort of like trying to balance on bean bags, right? Like I had a bunch of small little bean bags under my feet. And I'm constantly trying to balance on those. I get in. And there across the room is this fabulous, wonderful blue being with this very large elongated skull. He looked like, he looked like one of the Parak, like he had a Paracas skull, you know, the, the, you know, Dr. Forrester, the guy who's over in South America that, that studies Paracas skulls and talks about how they, how they have just distinct different genetics. Kim Jim sort of has that elongated, Paracas style skull. He has big, beautiful blue eyes. And I'm not putting you to sleep there, am I, Rob? No. Yeah. <laughs> and he were you just visioning it? And he uh he pat he was sitting on a white soft settee and he's he patted it with his hand. And I heard him very loud, come sit with me, David. We have a lot to talk about. And he patted it. He had three long fingers 
And I sat down next to him, his feet where his legs were curled up. And he was sitting on three long prehensile toes. And he had this tunic on, it covered his bits. And it was almost like a dress. They all wore these fabulous tunics. His was black. And he patted this thing. So I sat down and he took my hand and his fingers wrapped around, his fingers were so long, he wrapped around my arm, forearm twice. And not tight, just held on to me. And he looked into my eyes like he was putting a move on me. It was like a hot date. And he, he, he got right up to me and he said, I want to talk to you about brain chemistry, chemistry and, the, and the chemistry of emotions because you have very deep feelings. I want to help you remove the emotions that are not yours, that were given to you. And this happens to all of us when you're born because all humans are born perfect. But through incidents, happenstance, and controls that are out of your own, people unload their bad things on you. And you, okay, and you yeah, uh, I think we all would love to have that. I would right? love to have that. Well, you know, he explained it that way. And so he very gently touched the side of my face, and I was in tears. I just broke down. I had such heavy tears. I was crying so hard. And, but I had a big smile and I was concerned about showing my teeth and I was sort of covering my mouth much like a, a, a if you've ever traveled to the east you see like uh, Asian ladies will cover their, their mouth when they laugh and it's a sign of respect and uh, uh, so I was kind of doing that but I was crying so hard and they were like these flowing tears of joy it was this massive catharsis all the toxins in my body had just left and this huge weight this emotional weight that had been sitting on the back of my neck all of my life was gone. Wow. Everything that was bad that was handed to me by somebody that I didn't deserve, it was explained and it was removed just like that. Probably a bunch of things. We probably have multiple things. So, but it all left at once, huh? Did you yeah, have an identification of what those things were or it just became superfluous in the feeling? It, I, it became superfluous because he was saying that all he was doing was purifying my soul and preparing me. And I just thought that was amazing. So I was crying and I, I, I finally caught on to the fact that I was a big blubbering idiot in front of this amazing, amazing fellow. And so I, I was able to ask him questions. And I remember Kim Jim has a, what I call a vestigial mouth. He has a hole and he has like um, a socket, but he doesn't have a throat. And he has like a little, like almost like a CPR dummy mouth where there's no hole, but they do take nutrients and the, they're in this little round thing with a trapezoid on the end. They put it in their mouth and they squeeze it and it's absorbed through their vestigial mouth. They have gums that are very hard. There are they're no teeth. And when he talked, he still had lip movement. But it sounded like me, 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 me. But I heard him speaking. I know, isn't that funny? But I heard him speaking quite, quite normally, like I'm speaking to you or you're speaking to me. And so he started telling me about my past lives. He told me that I was a, uh, I worked for the FBI or before the FBI, the, the, the secret service for the U.S. government in the 1930s. I was a chief inspector police officer in the Bronx and he took me back there. Yeah, you told me. Uh, that's an interesting story. Tell them, oh what you were, tell them what you were doing back then in that lifetime. That was really spooky. Now, this was also, by the way, a reoccurring nightmare that I used to have at the age of four and five. And I was wearing a, a flat foot sort of captain's uniform, a heavy wool blue pea coat with gloves, one of those crenellated caps and a uniform. And I would walk up these stairs of this brownstone in the pissing rain in New York. This is me. I'm dreaming this when I'm four. And I open the door and a fella in a fedora and a soft gray suit opens up the door and he hands me a Ziploc baggie with about 30 or 50 tiny little humanoids that are white and they all have their mouth open and they have like white eyes with a black sort of coal mark around them and they're tiny. They're only about a, they're only about two inches high and they're very sad. They're very sad looking like they've all been killed or they were a bad experiment. 
And so I would go up to the door. The agent would meet me. He'd hand me this bag of these little dead people. I'd put them in my pocket and goes, and the guy would tell me, yep, we found another, another uh, location. And then I would wake up. Well, I'd be screaming and crying when I was four because it was so frightening. Well, what I didn't know was this was a real past life dream because we remember those things when we're tiny. And so Kim Jim took me there and explained to me why I had that dream. Now, the next segment was me getting killed in World War II. Apparently, I was a wing gunner in uh, uh, the South Pacific during World War II. I was very well liked, and I died young. And so the reason I was given the life that I was given this time is because I had suffered quite a bit, apparently. And a lot of it was emotional trauma. And so they, they work with us over a period of lifetimes. Many of these special beings are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years old. And they've been working with us for a very long time. And so Kim Jim sort of explained the whole thing. And when he took me through the dream process and showed me my past and then showed me exactly where I'm at now today, he reoriented me and guided me onto the path that I'm on now, which is really very different. My whole perspective in life changed. I was never a bad person, Rob, but I didn't understand completely the idea that we can manifest the reality around us merely by thinking of it. And that by keeping our thoughts pure and loving, we can continue to manifest pure love on the planet. And then from there, Kim Jim looked at me and he said, are you ready to go now? And I thought they were going to take me home. But instead, he pointed up like this. And of course, I cracked a huge smile, started crying again. And so I got to go on a ship. And basically, we walked out of the tent. And then I was transported up, teleported up many miles above the surface of the planet with Kim Jim holding my hand up to this bottom of this massive disc, round disc craft, a saucer. And then I remember floating just above the bottom of the floor of the saucer and it closed silently and seamlessly under us. And then he said, here, David, hand on railing, fun. And it was a blue light railing, like a like an escalator railing, only it was made out of blue light. And he said, here, David, step on here. And it was a floating square platform that was somehow attached to these blue railings. And you could see the whole underside of the ship. Uh, there was all these extraterrestrials on these blue platforms riding up and down these escal escalators to different places within the base of this giant, vast, vast ship. It was vast. It was like huge. And so... I told Kim, Jim, I said, you know, I have really, my legs are really wobbly. I have really bad pins and needles. And he sort of ignored that. And we, we got through the, the midship's deck and we went up, 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 up on this es blue escalator. And then he helped me down off the platform after we passed through a porthole in the center of the floor. Mm -hmm. That floor was all like black glass, just like the other ship that, I sh that you have photographs of was this black reflective glass and honestly about a hundred meters away from where kim jim is standing with me there are these giant black sarsens or these giant obelisks and then there was two obelisks in the center of that circle like sort of like a very techy stonehenge there were these two tall grasshopper beings with these fabulous gemstone dresses on touching these buttons like this one with his back to the other and there was a model of the model of the moon and the earth floating above them in a hologram form it's the other one uh where you see the black floor oh yeah you, i, I, I thought i would go into that you, you're talking about the chip so oh that, that you just passed it. there you go see that floor yeah, at the base of those panels, that's very much what the ship of this the, the floor is like on this other ship, and um, I could see them controlling the ship. Kim Jim held my hand and looked up to me, and he said, "David, I'm going to leave you now, but I will return in two years to come and visit you. I am giving you to Eram. Now, Eram is this beautiful, just loving, beautiful, sexy." 
giraffe girl with fine silky black hair and she looked at me and she said with her mind she said i am taking you to weimer don't gaze don't look directly at the controllers you may gaze at their greatness with peripheral vision only they don't really like your species and so she held my hand and we sort of slid across the floor and i was introduced to weimer and weimer was my deck guide and my traveling companion he was tall he's about nine foot tall he had bright yellow skin and tiny little black eyes and he was very sweet and he was a fabulous mathematician and he was a fabulous scientist. He gave me my mathematics downloads. So now let's regress for a second. When I went through the grist mill of the public educational system in Manhattan Beach back in the 60s and 70s, if you, if you didn't come from a good family and the kids were all, you know, swishy with mathematics by the time they were in fourth grade, they didn't want to get to know you. By the time I was in sixth grade when we were doing fractions, I was getting migraines. I just, you know, I struggled with two plus two. I really did. And I think a lot of people will agree if you don't get mathematics right by the time you're in second grade, you'll never get it right. And of course, I had this wonderful hippie mom who was an animal activist and an artist. And she said, ah, you only need mathematics to balance your checkbook. So when I met one, when I met didn't Weimer, have a deep space, but go ahead. Right. When I met Weimer, what Kim Jim had done was he he realigned all the synapses in my mind and cleared out all the BS so that when Weimer got a hold of me, he was able to do a direct telekinetic telekinesis download of Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, Euler's formula, the, 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 the five kinematic equations. He just went bang, 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 bang. So by the time he's folding me in this wonderful chair to go on this trip, I had already understood completely had a complete knowledge of uh, James Clark Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. And I wasn't shocked by that. It was like, it gave me something to talk to him about. He had to give me the information in order to have any kind of interesting time with me. So when I was asking him about micrometeorite showers and pulsars and gamma radiation waves and all the stuff that comes at you in a ship during interstellar travel, what's protecting the ship? Weimer looked at me and said, we call that an Orlon. And an Orlon forms naturally around the ship when we hit 78,000 kilometers per minute. And then it stays there no matter how fast we increase our speed. It's like a warp bubble. And so it can let us pass through the center of a giant sun unscathed. He, he said that all the species that have traveled through space all discovered the Orlon as a natural occurrence as soon as you hit that speed, 78,000 kilometers per minute. It's a warp bubble that, that develops around the ship so that you can skip through different uh, covariance of time. You can get through uh, the difficulties of velocity and angular kinematics. You can slip into different uh, dangerous fields totally unscathed. So we rode through what I can only describe as a, as a electrical crack in space when he got me seated in, in front of the window of this giant ship. There was other humans with me. When he got me seated in, the, in front of the window, and that's not Weimer's ship. This is the one, this is not Kim Jim's ship that I went on. That's just, can you show one of the other uh, diagrams of that ship with the mathematics that I wrote down yeah. for you. There we go. All right, so that's my mathematics are real. And so that's the exponential outgoing spherical waves, right? That's not my formula. That's the formula they downloaded. So you got to let your friends all screenshot that and they can go, go try to find that math world. And you know what? It's, it's there. I've had a couple of friends of mine at, uh, at uh, SpaceX go, woo, you know, David getting into quantum theory, huh? And I said, no, I just drew, drew this out on this picture, exponential wave function. So it's a, it's an energy wave that comes out exponentially. So there you go. Yeah. I want so, to it a little bit easier and bigger to see. So um, this kind of, thank you. Yeah. So this kind of shows you uh, how, uh, 
the energy is transferred from the exterior of the sphere of the ship into these crystal panels. And then there's another diagram that shows the rotational value and the waves, how they recharge the entire ship. So there's the mathematics for it. And I just put it on a, a, a XY plane so that people sort of had a way to make a reference. That little character there is supposed to be Kim Jim and he's between that. Over here. Yeah. That's Kim Jim way down. That black triangle is actually sort of the floor guiding me over to him. Um, so Weimer opened up all these new pathways in my mind to allow me to absorb higher concepts of mathematics. They showed me how they communicate higher mathematics on a much different level than, than Terra and physics. They really love us, but our physics are pretty pathetic. And um, unfortunately, in the world of physics, I know there's some physicists that are probably going to watch this. They're going to go, this guy's a kook. But there's going to be some other ones that go, hmm, well, listen to this. All of the physics information that we have, all the stuff that I don't understand, all the stuff that the people that have MAs in astrophysics don't understand, it'll take another 10 or 15 years to get there to understand. All of those physics only apply to this planet because of the unique gravity, the unique light, the unique electromagnetism and the dipole relationship between our sun and earth and the unique protective bubble which is called the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud around this solar system. The only reason our physics work on Terra is because they're Terran physics. When you travel, and I know that, you know, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and all these other billionaire kooks think that we're all going to be zipping around in, in deep stellar space in these earthly rocket ships. Well, Flash Gordon or not, those mathematics that you've learned on this planet are not going to help you when you're out there, just like Enrico Fermi said, if you imagine a balloon with millions and trillions of dots on the balloon, pointed on every place of the balloon, as many dots as you can get on this massive balloon, that's the universe and those are the galaxies in the universe. If you suck all the air out of that balloon, you just have one black dot. Every part of the universe is the center of the universe. When you have- the, the, the quantum nature. I wanted to go into one other thing here to 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 kind of reinforce what you're doing. So so after uh, this journey and his, well, we can continue on the journey. But after uh, he was downloaded this information, um, he started to uh, be learning some of these advanced mathematical formulas. And right. when the girl from SpaceX came into his bakery. He goes, what do you think about people up there? They went for a thing and she had uh, some notes. I think she had to carry it with her all the time because it was sensitive. And you said, oh yeah, this is some, he goes, he goes oh, let me see, it's math. Goes, oh, no, 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 no. And he looked at it and goes, oh, this is all correct, except for uh, this. And she right. goes, what? And he goes, let me write it. He goes, no, no, you can't write it. So he wrote down this formula. She didn't even understand it. He took, right. she took it to her superior project manager and he said, where'd you get this? This is correct. And so they gave him a scholarship in right. physics. And he's been, right. he's been struggling to wrap his mind around it. And during one of his midterms, was it Weimer who came in? No, this is, that, that was L. Uh, L is another being. We're going to have to talk about L another time. He's what's called a vibrational being. Um, when he Kim came in and he, he bought these crystals. And, yeah, he brought a bunch of crystals and lenses. And, and he uh, basically you know, tutored him and probably did another download in his brain where he was able to pass his yeah. advanced physics. And I don't know if you want to talk about um, some of the things you're going to be doing in the future or not, um, sure. but um, uh, he has some uh, physics and um, he's going to be helping in the pretty much near future after the solar pulse and things get right. cleared. And another thing I want to mention is, is a lot of people uh, are, you know, they're getting rid of the bad guys and all that. And what's happening is, is most of the negativity on the earth is being fomented by uh, rogue or minion type humans, hybrids right. influenced by rogue extraterrestrials. So they're not going to help us fix the world. No. They are going to remove the rogue element and the human hybrids that have sold us out and have been destroying us in an attempt Correct. at enslavement. 
So Correct. But we're going to be left alone with a PTSD. Where are we going to go? And this is up to us. And the solar event and flash will, uh, I believe, very clearly um, have people woken up. There will probably be much more sightings in the near future in the next couple of years or so. But right. um, at that point, then we have to recalibrate our thinking and our societal relationships and our um, and our societal infrastructure and our core belief systems. So um, I want to clarify that when you said they're they're gonna they're gonna help us and they're gonna help us by removing the eight hundred pound gorilla and then we're little babies and we have to reformulate. So right. uh, I guess you want to go back to the journey, but um, or you can talk about the technology that he showed me some really advanced uh, three dimensional uh, tools and and they've been giving him all kinds of information he gets over and goes wait a minute you know and whenever he's ready they have more tools and designs of technologies one was using a right. radio and communication and right correct me if i'm wrong i'm not sure of everything but um why don't you talk about the big one that um you're hoping or if you want to about what you're going to do for spacex right well you know this is this is dependent on whether i whether i i, I want to work for them and you know every every corporation has its own agenda and so i've been at nighttime when i go to sleep i harmonize and i i communicate and i reach out to kim jim and i'm having discussions with him one of the things about receiving downloads is that you have when you develop a relationship with species that are off world and you you trust each other you have to absolutely tell them that your mind is your sacred space and that they're only allowed in according to your will and, and to your abilities and that anytime I can kick them out or shut them down and terminate the relationship and you have to have that kind of rapport otherwise uh, techno beings or uh, emotional beings or the wrong type of beings will just flood your mind and you'll go nuts you really have to have the kind of relationship where you say okay this is too much information right now I'd like you to slow down because I'm a Terran and they respect that immensely. Kim Jim told me when we were sitting in the tent after we were done talking, he said that David, I will be sending several special people in to help you digest what's happened to you. And it's gonna take you at least three to six months to come to terms with this experience. So don't be afraid, everything will be fine. So, having this doctor from SpaceX was one of those people that Kim Jim sent. She came in and I could tell immediately. Now, physical contactees will tell you this if you ask them, what's the one thing that they do for us that helps us? And they'll tell you, when you have contact, they put something in you not like a nano, not like some sort of robot that's going to control you. They put like a, a light into your chest. It's like a little orb. And you know those light orbs that we see sometimes in meetings and we'll see photographs of people and there'll be visitors. It's almost a tiny little orb goes into your chest and it stays there in your heart. And it allows you to filter out the BS. And that little orb that I have helps me see the other people that have it too. And I know you have it, but this doctor had it and she didn't know she did. They put it in her. So she walked into my pie shop and, you know, we started chatting and stuff. We, uh, we did the mathy mathy thing. And then she came back and I told her what happened to me. She had the, the, the gall to come back and find out if I was some sort of like, you know, closet math specialist who decided to make pies and give up on the world of science or something she thought i was already a professor you know she was 20 years younger than me i'm 56 so i just said no i said i have a very special friend who helps me with higher mathematics and she goes oh who's that and i said well i said i wasn't sure when i first met you but are you one of them and she looked at me and she went well that depends on what one of them means i said one of them and she goes, that's even more, you know, complex. So, so she told me who she was. She had very, very, very top, top crypto special position within that company. 
and we become friends and I'm, I'm not going to say her name and I, and I don't want her to get into trouble. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things that Elon does that I don't approve of, but that's just because I feel bad, you know, for, for certain types of humanity. We have a very important role as, as, as care providers for our species. And if we are to understand how the, the nature of rocks and stones and pools of water, all, all are living things, all trees, all life, all objects on this planet that come from Gaia have the right to exist. And each one of these things can teach us. And you can learn just as much quantum mathematics from a, from a cobble rock in a flowing river than you can from Kim Jim. But it's that ability for you to see that. And I think that the, the most important thing is that in order to understand the dimension in which we exist and the way we affect the dimension in which we exist, we have to really understand what our position is and why we're here on this planet. You're not here to go to work for Burger King and come home and get drunk on Budweiser and slap your wife. That's not what life's all about. You're not here to own a car dealership and make a million dollars selling Lexuses. That's not what life's all about. Life is about the exchange of love and understanding our, our very deep and important role in protecting this garden Eden that we were given to cherish. But we are also part of the same family of animals and family of, of sentient life, whether it's a rock or a tree. I don't care if it doesn't walk around and make a noise. Everything is full of life energy. And we have to realize that and understand our place within it. Everything has the value of existence. And so those were the, the key essential gifts that were given to me. So whether I do anything with SpaceX or not, but what I have done with my friend who I've made from SpaceX is discuss some other things of some very special technology that Weimer and Kim Jim have given me. It's called polymetry, and it's about building three-dimensional interstellar models for doing very fast travel through deep, deep space so that we can fly just like they do. Humanity is not ready to be given this gift, so we're working on it in secret, and not one person has all the answers except for me. And so the doctors and the designers and the computer programmers all work under me and we are designing a polymetry system so that when we are ready, that we'll be able to navigate the cosmos very, very quickly and go to these places just like our friends do when it's time for us to join that family. Mm -hmm. Right now, we can't release that information because governments will use it against each other. Yeah, they could use it. The we're not going to give them anything that could be weaponized. Um, the Venusian, we're not giving them anything. I Venusian, have a lot of that stuff. The Venusians are, yeah, are working with scientists to, to reinforce what you're saying um, in uh, time travel in the fourth dimensional information. And they're training them away from government. They're in uh, secret bases. Um, right. I believe there's one in South America underground. And they're Creating, oh, yeah. training them in new technologies so that when we reach that level, um, it's not controlled by mind controlled or scientists that have been compromised and uh, technology that's been uh, given by extraterrestrials and, and, and promoted by people with power structures. It's basically, they're gonna be the guardians of the time technology and uh, we'll have right. a responsible use of it. Would you like to talk about any of these images about what they are? and? Uh, and it's the top view of the ship and those are the crystals and you can see at the bottom that blue circle on the far right is the ocular gateway and the one that's sort of white blue above that is the sound gateway. I thought it would be nice to show um, how the ship la layout was so I've done a top view down. Okay and uh, do you want to talk about either of these in detail looks like here's the the dielectric. Okay so that's basically those, those orbs that you see in the bottom of ships they collect uh, they the collapsers. Yeah, in a way, there's no friction in space, but they do collect uh, vibrations and they transfer that vibration up into those crystal panels, which produce a new harmonic, which is a form of energy. And I'll just, I just have to go over some of that. I mean, unfortunately, all my stuff's tied up in, in I don't have something to show you, right? They told me something very interesting. And this is something that I can tell you because I'd love it if some of your people or somebody that watches the show, I don't know, 
if they can work on this because my mind is too busy right now with some of the other projects they've put me on. These are all gifts for humanity, which they will all be released at the right time on the World Wide Web. They won't be given to governments. But the one thing they told me, which I found was very fascinating that I'm only just starting to understand, is that sound does not go away. Sound travels to what they call a fractal sound continuum, where sound is recycled and they use sound as an unlimited source of pollution-free energy. And it's only a human being that thinks, you clap your hand and you don't hear it anymore, that that sound is gone, but it's not. That sound travels forever. And it goes to the fractal sound continuum, which is a sphere around our universe. It's recycled and is put back into the universe into a form of harmonic that we can't understand or hear because we don't have the technology to hear it. In the beginning was the word, the word with God, the word with God. And the Pleiadians, they, their ships are, are sound powered and light separated. Their ships wow. are actually built from mushrooms grown in out of space. And they use a mushroom because of the chordal chambers and the, the, uh, the aspect of sound. So, and if we look at everything as part of the one uh, and sound, right. it's like energy. Energy isn't right. created or destroyed, it's just changing states. So it's Correct. frequency out of our dimension and that's right. it. I mean, yeah, I work with Fred Bell. So I, I'm not, I don't have the math, but uh, a lot of these concepts and, you know, people, you know, you know, the quantum string field theory, it's like, you know, the electrons don't revolve around uh, right. the uh, uh, atoms, you know, in a circle like an orbit, like you would think the planets do. They actually go and they jump and they move. And sometimes they're they're in a point and another time they're in a wave in between. So there, there's right. this kind of duality, right? Right. And I tell you, and it's not, it's the technology aspect is not fascinating. The aspect of them telling me we love you, little human. We know that this will help you. We're going to work with you and we're going to work with this other one. Because what's fascinating with these guys is like, you know, they brought you into my life and they brought Nathan into your life and all the other people that we've met. And they know about this stuff. They know that you and I will probably get together in two years with somebody else. And all of a sudden something will light up from that and something wonderful will happen because we're part of this beautiful, beautiful plan. And it's just like God's plan. And it, they want all of us to find love and harmony and to love each other and to always, always keep in mind that the thoughts that we keep in the back of our mind will follow us throughout our days. And they can see our thoughts like a little picture above our head. So if you truly love somebody, they see it. And the people that they touch see it too. And that protects us from the bad people who pretend to love us. And it's really interesting because I've had some experiences with people that are quote unquote in the UFO community. As it turned out, they were trying to milk me for information. It was really creepy, but it was that beautiful thing they put inside of me to help me identify that. And so you find that you only have a few friends and that's okay, you know, but the ones that you have are just based on love and trust. And that's the best type, don't you think? Absolutely. That love, it boils down to kindness. You know, right. uh, you know, I was asking about, you know, you know, about my emotional and mental development and the kind of things that, that you got relieved of. And I said, they said, Rob, they said, Patrick, practice a kindness and patience. Mm -hmm. That's the key. And when I Absolutely. first had my interview with the Venusians, they, um, after telling me all the answers to the questions, then she recited the poem of Saul uh, oh. or, or who became Paul. And right. this is, if I have all the knowledge in the world, all the charity, all the kindness, if I don't have love, what am I but a clanging reverberating bell? If right. I have all the knowledge, I mean, if I, if I do this and that, but I don't have love. And that was really for me because I am pretty much like a lot of people know when you hear me, I'm just going to, go on about all the things to kind of give you a background that right. they're here, they're benevolent and the right. amazing technologies of ascension or translation and staying young right. and kind of showing you that it's real. Here's a picture of a, of a Venu of Venusian on earth in 1954. And here's one of her 2013 has an age to bet. Valiant Thor, the same thing. I've seen the right. images and I met him. So um, I kind of do that as an intellectual thing, but it's really, um, 
not necessary. You have to, I'm slowing down a little bit to give people the, the feeling of love and what it's about. Um, right. You know, we're, I, I don't mind going longer, but I wanted to ask you if you want to uh, finish the journey uh, to the world and your what happened, or we could save that for another time. What do you think? Well, let's let's save it for another time. I'd be interested to see what some of the feedback is from your community. And really, all I wanted to say was that the most important thing out there is really remembering that we don't need policing. We don't need governments. Humans have been taking care of each other for millennia. And, you know, I don't need the U.S. government to represent me by building nuclear bombs to threaten little poor people with. And we should just all love each other. And that's the underlying message between everything I do and all the messages I received from Kim Jim and the little people that came to look through your window. They're very, very sweet. They're sentient. They love us. And the more we love Mother Nature and the more we keep that tape looped in the back of our head that we love the planet and that life is a precious gift. It really is, Rob. This dimension where we can experience color and sound and taste and love, it's one of the most precious dimensions of all. And we're these little angel spirits that have been allowed to live in this dimension. And they love that about us and they want to help nurture that in us so that we can feel the fulfillment, feel the fulfillment of this dimension. And then we can share that with each other when we wake up. That's what the queen actually said to me. I was kind of like, I don't know, man. I, you give me this information and people are like crappy. Oh, you're making it up or that's all lies. And I'm like, you know, here I thought, you know, I got this, this actual message delivered to the public from the hierarchy of light to t tell us and tell them about love and reemphasizing the teachings of Christ. I was like, I don't know. What's he, you know, I don't want to be here. She said, Rob, don't hasten, don't seek to hasten your exit from the uh, right. physical plane. Life uh -huh. Uh, is a precious gift so it is that, a precious. that so i thank you very much and folks so david will be appearing at my conference this summer um in mount shasta the 7th to 10th of july with uh michael sala laura uh, oops michael sala probably well he's Come on, michael it'd be great to see you well actually he can't announce it until he I, says I can't announce he's coming because he if there's any restrictions on travel he won't he may he said he's, he's such a fascinating guy. I can't wait to meet him. If he does show up, I just love it. He's so neat. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then we've got uh, we've got some other people, uh, you know, uh, Eisenhower, uh, Raymond, of course. Oh, she's he's wonderful. Guy. Laura's wonderful. Yeah. So there's a lot of good people coming, um, and um, we'll have a lot of uh, good times there. And I'm doing it in the beginning of July, so hopefully it's not so hot and that we don't have um, any fires. Hopefully, some of that can be. Well, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. I'll bring my doom back, and we can get a drumming circle going. Oh yeah, we have that all the time. So, we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm gonna I'm gonna end the recording here, and uh, David and I have a quick chat after this. But thank you for coming on. Thanks, uh, Rob. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. All right, and I'm sure you're gonna get some other requests. Um, I think. Um, you know, I was encouraging uh, Michael and possibly Alfred Lombard Weber might want to interview as well because, um, and uh, because they both are are good analysis and um, you know can share. He'll he'll research the heck out of uh, your information and a lot oh, great. of that stuff probably can't be um, verified except for your math genius and other stuff would indicate. And that's generally going to be above well, most people's heads. It's not me. It's them. I'm just a channel. You know, yeah. that's the thing is just we can just channel and hopefully we channel the right thing in the right message. But it's just about channeling. And when you find that great source of love, how can you not want to share it? Right. right? All right. Well, I hope uh, all of the people who are listening here and be interested. And if you guys want to um, uh, reach out to David, you can contact me and uh, if other people want to interview you and move forward with some other um, ideas and stuff. Uh, we'll talk again. Thank you, folks, for the victory Thanks. of life, and we'll Bye. see you soon. Bye. Okay. Uh, there we go. And bye.